In 1990, six years after the original, the Gremlins were back. Bigger, scarier, funnier, nastier, and more inventive than ever before. As this time, the action takes place in New York, in a wacky high-tech building called the Clamp Center, providing an interesting and limitless setting for the Gremlins' madness. When Billy Peltzer is now an architect at the Clamp Center, he gets reunited with the Mogwai Gizmo, after the passing of his owner, Mr. Wing. But of course, as you'll expect, the rules that accompany the Mogwai are broken, as Gizmo gets wet and his troublesome clones eat after midnight, with the gremlins causing all manner of chaos in the building. Gremlins 2 The New Batch sees the return of director Joe Dante, producer Steven Spielberg, composer Jerry Goldsmith, along with actors Zach Gallahan, Phoebe Cates and Dick Miller. But what's interesting about Gremlins 2 is that it's actually nothing like the first movie. It feels much more like a wacky oddball comedy, full of fourth wall breaking moments, along with scenes that even send up and spoof the original Gremlins movie. Gremlins 2 The New Batch is fast and hyperactive and wonderfully all over the place. It's like the movie itself is on a sugar high, with no chance of coming down anytime soon. Whether or not you like the over-the-top, insane style of comedy of the sequel, or the more restrained style of the original, one thing is for sure, you've got to admire Gremlins 2 for going in a different direction, and giving the movie a different tone to that of the original. So today we are going to explore 10 amazing facts about Gremlins 2 The New Batch. Let's check this out. eating in an airplane and they cross a time zone. I mean, it's always midnight somewhere. Number 10, super aerial footage. The movie starts with a surprisingly not out of place Looney Tunes short with Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, which sets up the mood that this movie is gonna be one off the wall wacky comedy to which the movie then literally starts with a very impressive aerial shot of New York City. However, this piece of film footage was actually filmed three years earlier, as it was footage of New York that was filmed for the Superman movie, Superman IV The Quest for Peace. Namely, the footage that was filmed for the Lois and Superman flying sequence. However, that particular bit of footage used at the start of Gremlins 2 was footage that never ended up being used for Superman 4. So I guess if you got the footage, why let it go to waste? So thus it was used as an introduction establishing shot for Gremlins 2 to show the viewer that the Gremlins shenanigans is now taking place in the Big Apple. Superman 4 The Quest for Peace may have been a bad movie, but at least it provided Gremlins 2 with some great aerial shots. I like the idea of a bad movie redeeming itself somewhat. Number 9 Christopher Lee's Howling Apology In Gremlins 2, Hammer Horror legend slash movie legend in general, Christopher Lee plays Dr. Caffeta, a sinister scientist who is hell-bent on studying diseases and weird creatures. Lee's involvement makes Gremlins 2 that bit more awesome and more of a spectacle. However, five years earlier, Lee starred in The Howling 2, which was a sequel to Joe Dante's original Howling movie, and is generally considered a downright awful movie and didn't go down too well. Lee, however, felt bad for his involvement in the dreaded sequel and even apologised to Dante on the set of Gremlins 2 for his acting role in The Howling 2 when he discovered that Dante had indeed directed the original. Well, that was nice of him. I mean, there's not much you can say about a movie that involves Christopher Lee talking about holy earplugs. Number 8. Wallace Out, Baker In In the original Gremlins, Chris Wallace provides the puppet effects, which by 1984 standards were flawless. Heck, they are still brilliant and hold up even today. 
However, after working on Gremlins, Wallace then got on board David Cronenberg's The Fly, providing the makeup effects for that movie too. Although, when Gremlins 2 went into production, Chris Wallace was offered the chance to come back to continue to provide his talents for Gremlins, but he turned down the job as he took on the role of director for The Fly 2. So Warner Brothers then turned to one of the most famous makeup effect artists of them all, Rick Baker, who had previously provided effects for Star Wars, Michael Jackson's Thriller and American Werewolf in London. At first, Baker was hesitant for getting involved with the Gremlins sequel, but he eventually got on board as he liked the inventive ideas of making different kinds of Gremlins, like the Bat Gremlin, Spider Gremlin, Vegetable Gremlin, and even the Electric Gremlin. They come in electric too? They do now. Number 7. Film Critic Revenge Gremlins 2 features a cameo by American film critic Leonard Moulton, who is literally giving a scathing review of the first movie until the Gremlins invade the set and take out their revenge on the unsuspecting critic. It is definitely one of my favourite fourth wall breaking moments in the movie. However, there is a deeper meaning to this scene, as Moulton was used in that scene as he gave the original Gremlins a very bad review, and most of what he is saying in Gremlins 2 is pretty much exactly what he said when reviewing the first movie. What's fun about a movie full of ugly, slimy, mean-spirited, gloppy little monsters who run amok and attack innocent people? Which makes his subsequent Gremlins attack that bit more funny and glorious. I love the fact that although Leonard Martin disliked the Gremlins brand, he still had the heart to feature in the sequel and send himself up. What a true good sport. Number 6. Gremlins destroy both the theatrical and home video versions of Gremlins 2. So yeah, there is a lot of cameos in Gremlins 2, from John Astin, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, composer Jerry Goldsmith, Henry Gibson, the Batman logo, and Jason Presson, aka one of the explorers, to name but just a few. But the most notorious cameo no doubt comes from the Hulkster himself, where during the movie, the Gremlins literally invade the movie's screening and mess with the actual movie's projection, where an angered Hulk Hogan threatens the Gremlins if they don't cut out their shenanigans, and let Gremlins 2 play as normal. Do you think the Grimsters can stand up to the Hulkster? Yeah, the sequence is out of place and brings the movie to a complete stop, but in a way that kind of makes it funnier and goes with the oddball comedy feel of Gremlins 2. However, when Gremlins 2 was released on home video, the sequence was completely changed to make it look like the Gremlins are destroying a videotape as opposed to a movie projector, where the Gremlins come face to face with old footage of John Wayne instead of Hulk Hogan, where he proceeds to shoot the Gremlins who are mucking around with the Gremlins 2 viewing. Personally, I prefer the Hulk Hogan version, as I find the John Wayne voice dubs to be awkward. Well, I warned him. I don't need varmints on my ranch. And when Gremlins 2 was released on DVD, the original Hulk Hogan scene was restored. Number 5. Video Game So a company called Sunsoft released a video game for Gremlins 2 for both the NES and Game Boy. Because back in those days, Nintendo was where it was at. And look at the game's cover. That looks frightening and badass. So for gamers who wanted to have the Gremlins destroy their game systems, you could play Gremlins 2, where you play as Gizmo as you have to work your way around the Clamp Center building, where you must eventually make it to the Gremlins Central Command Center, where it's up to Gizmo to destroy them all. It has basic gameplay with fairly impressive graphics for its time, but nothing too spectacular. Although some of the levels of the game make some of the rooms in the clamp building look like some kind of futuristic medieval torture room. Like why would there be spikes on the floor like that? Given that there's many, many, many employees at the clamp building, that is just a lawsuit waiting to happen. Then again, given how batshit insane Gremlins 2 actually is, I actually wouldn't be surprised if there was a medieval futuristic torture room in the building. Number 4. The Curious Case of the Water Hatches So with the Gremlins brand came a lot of interesting merch, 
like the game as mentioned, along with dolls and even breakfast cereals. However, the most weirdest piece of merchandise associated with the Gremlins is the water hatches. Yep, LJN went all out with crazy ideas with trying to create some kind of products out of the Gremlins, which leads us to the water hatches, which would see tiny rubber figurines of Gizmo and a Gremlin who come out of an egg, in which once you put them in water, they apparently grow and expand in size. Which, although watching rubber expand may have been cool before the internet, it makes you wonder if the brilliant minds behind the water hatches knew anything about Gremlins as water doesn't make them grow, but multiply. In fact, it's eating after midnight, which makes them physically change. Number three, the brain gremlin could have had a different voice. In Gremlins 2, the new batch, we see the arrival of the brain gremlin, a gremlin with a vast intellect and complete vocabulary of words, along with British accent. You know, to make him sound more smart, I guess. No, clearly not. Fun, but in no sense civilized. The part of the brain gremlin was voiced by Mark Dodson, who had previously provided some voices for Return of the Jedi. However, before Dodson got on board, none other than Tim Curry was considered for voicing the brain gremlin. Now that would have been awesome! Like, wow! That just would have made Gremlins 2 that bit more brilliant. And not only that, but Curry is also a voice actor, so it would have been perfect. But for whatever reason, it didn't end up happening. My guess is because at the time, Tim Curry was too busy starring as Pennywise for the IT miniseries. Tim Curry really did not have the best of luck with Steven Spielberg's Amberlin Company back in the 80s, as just one year prior, he was considered for the part of Judge Doom for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but of course that went to Christopher Lloyd. Number two, the struggle to get Joe Dante. Originally, Joe Dante had no interest whatsoever in returning to Gremlins. The studio offered him the opportunity to return, but he originally turned it down. So the project proceeded without him, and there were many ideas floating around with what they could do with the Gremlins follow-up. Some of these ideas include the Gremlins let loose in Las Vegas, and even more bizarre, one idea was to see the Gremlins on Mars. It was clear Warner Brothers needed the guidance of Dante, so in order for his return, Dante was given full creative control over the movie, and Gremlins 2 was even assigned a higher budget. This is probably why Gremlins 2 feels like a much more oddball, wacky comedy, similar to other Dante projects such as In a Space and Matinee, because it is more of a personalised Joe Dante film, and even in some ways feels more like a spoof of the original, what with its constant winks, nudges and breaking of the fourth wall. Dante would go on to say that he actually preferred Gremlins 2 over the original. In fact, Gremlins 2 does have a fan base of fans who do prefer it to the original, as it is a different kind of movie. Two years later, the exact same thing happened with Warner Brothers once again, when they really wanted Tim Burton to return for Batman Returns, and gave him full creative control in return for his input. Number 1. A beloved character nearly returned. The original script was to see the return of Randall Peltzer, the crazy inventor and father to the Billy character from the original movie. The character was going to show up at the end once all the gremlins had been destroyed, where he would give Gizmo a custom made wetsuit to assure that he would never get wet again, and thus putting a stop once and for all to all the gremlins chaos. Actor Hoyt Axon, who played Randall in the original movie, was available and eager to return to the part. However, it was decided that the character's cameo should be written out of the movie, on the grounds that it was felt like the movie was going over time as it was, with many other scenes having to be removed and deleted. So it was decided to not have the Randall character turn up in order to try and control the movie's already overrunning time duration. Well guys, that was my look into Gremlins 2. And if you want a more coherent and contemporary movie like the original Gremlins, then you might not like Gremlins 2 The New Batch. I do like the sequel for its more balls to the wall comedy. No whiffs or buts about it, this is a comedy movie and that is all there is to it. I put it in the same category as Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, so I definitely say check it out. It's brilliant and it's generally funny and pretty creative with some very good special effects, 
Just if you do watch it, try not to compare it to the original. And also try not to make too much sense out of it for that matter. Anyway, I'm Minty, and why does a part of me want to see gremlins on Mars? See ya!